feel free to uh, you know stay in touch with your buddy or who are you connected with through this course uh, really help you okay so we spoke about some applications last time um, you know computer vision has a lot of amazing applications so we'll look into some of that um, going forward i think today uh, today we'll not be looking at any of these but we'll be looking at image compression how to do image compression so um, so we are here actually we're somewhere in between these two so maybe we're here week two right we only had one lecture in week one um, so we'll look at some convolution and transforms in this lecture uh, okay i'll put the slide on whenever we meet online so i can highlight this and you can you know have your cameras turn on but um, so we also spoke about last lecture some of the things that we'll be touching on in this course so image processing denoising smoothing classification and so on so today we are going to focus on uh, some of this and i think compression image compression um, we'll go into denoising and smoothing in the next lecture yeah so slowly we're going to go from basic image processing towards learning and using data to learn better from images okay so today um, we'll do an you know we'll do some intro for machine learning and uh, I noticed in the survey that some of us have exposure to machine learning and some of us don't. So if you don't have exposure, this, is, this will kind of help fill up the gap. Um, and we'll focus on unsupervised learning for today. Right? So what is machine learning? Um, machine learning in short is uh, learning from examples, learning from data, right? We looked at the example of a kid learning to identify an apple from a set of objects. Right? That's an example of data-driven learning. So uh, in machine learning broadly, there's like two to three different boxes that you can put methods into. One is supervised learning, right? Okay, this is an apple, this is a bottle, this is this. So I'm giving labels to different data points and then using those labels to train, validate, and test. So that is supervised learning. Unsupervised learning, you don't have labels, right? So you say, okay, I see this. I don't know what to call it, but I see it. I see this. So even in just seeing things, you can learn something. Like without someone telling you, like I walk into a room and I'm like, I see a table, I see a bottle, I see a bag, right? I see you guys. I have no idea what to put, like I don't know what name to put to you guys or to these objects, but just knowing that these things are there, I can learn something. So that is unsupervised learning, right? So it's pretty fascinating. So a couple of things that fall under unsupervised learning is clustering uh, and dimensional reduction, right? So clustering is, again, I have a bunch of images of different categories, and I don't know what the categories are, but can you cluster them so that images in one cluster have the same category? But you don't know what the category is. Maybe you have flowers, you have plants, you have dogs, you have people, right? Maybe you can cluster them, but you may not be able to say what it is. But that is still useful to know that this is some cluster that's different from that cluster. If you were doing supervised learning, you would actually put a label to it as well. Right? So that is clustering. So we'll look at clustering probably uh, next lecture. So we may not have time today. But next lecture, we'll look at clustering. So today, we'll focus on this uh, dimensionality reduction. So machine learning, unsupervised learning, within that, we're going to be looking at dimensionality reduction today. So dimensionality reduction is basically, you know, something that you might have seen before, compressing data signals, right? There are some methods for that. Uh, uh, dimensionality reduction is also useful for visualization. You want to visualize things, big data. Uh, it's useful for feature extraction and also discovery of structure, like what kind of structure is present in the data. Um, so we'll be focusing on this today. How many of us have been exposed to unsupervised learning before? One, two, three, four. Okay. okay. Uh, so let's look, look a little bit more about this, right? So supervised learning is you develop predictive models based on input and output data. So there's another way of thinking about it. You have, you have an input and then you have an output. And you have this pair, right? So maybe you have like I1, O1, I2, O2, I3, O3, and so on. 
So this would be your maybe train or uh, let's say train set. So you have always have pairs in supervised learning, you have pairs of data points. An input is always associated with an output. The output could be anything, it could be a class. Hey, here's an image of a bottle, right? This is a bottle. And then say, okay, this is a bottle. So you'll have a text say that says bottle, and you'll have an image as a data point. So you always have pairs. In unsupervised learning, um, you only have inputs. So you'll have I1, I2, I3, so on. So there's, the O is missing in unsupervised learning. But even from just inputs, you can learn something. So that is the area of unsupervised learning. Yeah, so supervised learning, um, so we're going to be looking at unsupervised learning today. Supervised learning, uh, you know, there's classification, regression, there's other methods that fall under supervised learning. We'll look at it maybe in a couple of lectures. How many of us have seen classification before? Exposed to classification, a couple of people. Okay. So supervised learning, we saw uh, what it means, right? So here, in supervised learning, you say, okay, this is an apple, this is a cube, this is a ball, and this is an apple. So this is your I, and this is your O, right? And then you say, well, what is this? Right, I have not seen this image, this specific image, but it looks closest to this. So because I have, you know, seen this in my training, so this is part of my training. This is maybe your test example. You say, okay, what is this? Well, you say, oh, that's an apple because my supervised model has learned to differentiate between different kinds of objects. And now it sees something like what it has seen in the, it's not the same, it's a sketch. It's not colored the same way as an apple, but you can see. Like, this is amazing. Like, this is what we do. We look at some abstract sketches and we say, oh, this is that. So we are doing supervised. We already have a good model in our brain that's able to even understand sketches of proper objects and say it is that object, right? Even though it, you haven't seen that before, right? So when you look at an art, for example, you go to a museum, you see an abstract painting. You've never seen that before, but you're like, oh, that looks like this. So your brain is able to map it to something that you know. So that you know, that's sophisticated supervised learning, but it's an example of supervised learning. Okay, unsupervised learning, you just have these. <laughs> Someone gives you five objects and then you look at it, you're like, okay, no one's telling me what it is. I just have these inputs. Can I make something out of it? That's unsupervised learning. All right, so uh, like we discussed um, in last lecture, We'll be having in-class exercises every lecture so that you guys stay awake, but also so that you can learn like and test your concepts as we go. So um, there is a poll um, in the link to the poll. Ayush, you have the link to the poll you can share on Discord. Uh, let's do that. Okay. So if you see this curve, what is this curve? It's a curve of signal values. There's a higher signal value, and the signal values start a trail, and they go towards zero for the image. So that is something that you compute based on experience. So you can just type SVD in Python or MATLAB. Let's not use MATLAB. Let's say Python. You'll get the signal values, and they usually have this kind of hyperbolic shape. And this line here that you see that's sliding across is where you're truncating the assumptions. So you're saying, I, I know this is not zero, but I'm not going to use it anyway. Right? And so you're only using this much information, and then maybe still doing reasonably well. So we saw maybe at this point you're doing like this, this is a factor of two. And then you go here, you you're losing a lot of information. So these are still not uh, not not significant. So they're not zero. So you're losing that information. This is what that this is showing, right? So as you go from here, 
So let's look at a compression of two. Okay, so at a compression factor of two, we are at this point on the left where the cursor is. So anything to the right, you ignore that information. But you still have a lot of information to the left. So what you see from this is there's a lot of useless information sitting in there that you can just truncate. Or I wouldn't say useless, but insignificant information or not as significant. But the significant ones are here. For some matrices, for some images, it's like, like this, it just kind of drops. So then you don't have to worry about losing information. Like for example, the rank one matrix, you'll just have the topmost single value. You'll have everything else zero. So that would be like an L-shaped curve for rank one matrix, yeah. So very fascinating. Um, so I just slide, you can see what happens. So this is telling you at what singular value, where in the singular value have you truncated to get this image? So you guys should take a look at this demo to understand how SVD is being used for image compression here. Any questions on this? Let me share here again. So this is the really amazing thing. You know, you take this matrix X, and then I have these factors U, um, sigma. And then maybe we transpose. Right. And there is something called K. So let's say this X is, uh, uh, let's say X is M by N, right? M rows and N columns. So in our previous case, maybe we had thousand by thousand. So M was thousand, N was thousand. In another example, we had one million and 100, right? When you had like 100 images stacked on top of each other, like each image stack, you know, stacked as a column, that was 1 million by 100. So that's M and that's N. So here, what's the dimension of, let's say this is, uh, let's say this is K. So that means you have K singular values that you're thinking as significant for the purpose of compression or whatever you want to do. So you're ignoring the rest, you're keeping the top K. So you can decide what K is, and that's what you saw earlier. Like as you slide, you're increasing or decreasing K. So K is the number of significant values. So that will be the dimension of the col number of columns, right? So the row dimension is still going to be M, M by K. What's the dimension of Sigma? You know? K by K, yep. And V, transpose. K by N, yep. right? So the thing with matrix multiplication is, is the inner dimensions have to match. If you multiply these two matrices, M by K and K by K, if the inner dimensions don't match, you've got it wrong. They always have to match. Right? The same thing here, K by K, K by N. So, but you might make a mistake on the outer dimensions too. <laughs> but at least check the inner dimensions and make sure you have them matching. Okay, so these, these are your signal vectors, right? And these are the signal values, okay. So you can see that if I actually did a full SVD, it would be M by M, and then M by N, and then N by N, something like that. So instead of having M by N, you're having M by K, right? Does that make sense? So for instance, this is, um, let's call it U tilde here, U tilde, sigma tilde, and V tilde. So let's say I wanna compare U, and then U tilde. So U tilde is M by, uh, mm, let's say M by M. Hey, sorry, U is U, M by M. U tilde is M by K. What is the compression factor here? Two 
M by K, right? Because it's M by M bits of information divided by M by K bits of information. So it gives you M by K. Right, if like M was like 100 and K was 10, you have a compression factor of 10. So you're compressing your image by a factor of 10, right? That's just for you. You have to do the same thing for sigma and B. And then that'll give you the total compression factor, right? So instead of storing U sigma V, you store U tilde, sigma tilde, V tilde, and you can use it to reconstruct the image. So on your device or wherever, you'll only store these uh, compressed versions, and that's the compression factor you're gonna get. Yeah. So this is one application of SVD. There's many applications of SVD, but for images, this is like a really cool application. So our next in-class exercise is based on that. Um, so you can actually work on and you know, just look at the details of this and identify. Um, so here, what we're doing is you want to pick the number of signal vectors that you want to reduce the information to so that you can get a particular compression factor. Right? So for instance, here, the file size is 20 MB. You want to go to a file size of 5 MB, so at least 5 MB. That's your compression factor. So you slide the K so that you can get that compression factor. So the question is, what is the K? So you start at 1000, you're going back towards 0. But somewhere in between, you'll be like at the right place where you get 5 Does that make sense? So just what I would do is write down those U sigma V transpose and do that math. That'll give you the conversion. So just write down the U sigma V transpose. Let's go over here. Let's activate the poll. Um. So what's the intuition here? So let's look at two scenarios. Uh, there's no compression. So this means you have 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, right? So this is the information that you have. So you need to store so much, OK? Let's say I did compression. Then the information I need to store is 1,000 by k. This is for u tilde plus k by 1000. This is for v tilde transpose. Right, the rightmost matrix, the leftmost matrix. The one in between, I need to store k. But k is insignificant as compared to k times 1000. So you can say this is roughly 2 times k times 1000. OK. So what we're saying is, let's say this is um, info one and this is info two so you're essentially saying info one divided by info two should be equal to um, 20 divided by five right because you want a compression from 20 me to 5 me that's a factor of four so you want the information to also compress by a factor of four so we just put plug it in. We say this is thousand by thousand divided by two k thousand. So this implies k is um, thousand by. Oh, it's actually a different answer. It's one twenty five. Yeah. Does that sound good? So it's not two hundred. It's one twenty five. So 200 would not cut it either. So your K has, K, K can be 125 or lower to compress to four by a factor of four or more. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so you need to, so when we say compression, what does it mean? 
Instead of storing x, we're going to store u tilde, we're going to store sigma tilde and v tilde. Does that make sense? So instead of storing one matrix, I'm going to store three matrices. However, the size of each matrix is going to be much smaller. So what's the size of the first matrix? That's 1,000 by k. The third matrix, that's k by 1,000. So that's two times 1,000 by k. But the middle one, that's, that's mostly zero. It only has k bits of information. So we just kind of, you can kind of throw it away because it's not, it's nothing compared to k times 1,000. So you roughly get two times k times 1,000. So your k has to be, so what does this imply? It means your k has to be less than 125 to get desired compression. I mean, this is a rough calculation. In practice, you might be like, okay, it's not exactly 5 MB. It might be like 6 MB or 4 MB, depending on what's going on. But this is of the same order. You should expect something like this. If you actually followed this and stored it, you should expect something like this in terms of compression. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, I know it's a little bit late, but maybe we, let's still take a break. If, you know, if someone needs to use a restroom or something, I'll be back in like three, four minutes. And we'll go to the end.